Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this evening's webinar with Kim Chavers. We're going to be talking about her transition into uh, into the role of head coach of the women's rowing program at Michigan State. And before we do that, we'll just uh, just wrap through a couple of things. We've got Asia Mahmoud um, coming up next week. She's going to be talking about um, all things handling the pandemic at the Drexel program. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, um, the week after Thanksgiving, we're going to talk about, we've got a three-part series talking about food, um, all about nutrition and, and and what some of the um, folks in around the, the professional sport world in Philadelphia are doing with um, with translating science to practical application for athletes. So um, some good ones coming up. And we've had, we've had a, a long drought, Kim, of rowing people. We've had... Ann Davis a couple of weeks back uh, from uh, from tennis, Anna Swisher from weightlifting, um, and and last time we actually had two weeks ago we had the mental performance coach from the Toronto Raptors uh, 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 talking about mental performance up there. So some really really cool uh, really cool conversations. But let's dive in. Let's let's get straight to it. Um, uh, Kim is a graduate of the sport coaching leadership program at Drexel and. Um, we're going to be chatting about her her role as a head coach and and also some of the insights of what if you knew then what you know now what would you have uh, what would you have have, um, have told yourself or what would you have done differently so Kim why don't you just um, welcome first of all and and thanks for joining us and love to hear just a little bit about how things are going for you guys in the middle of this um, crazy new world that we're living in yeah well thank you so much for for inviting me I really appreciate it. Um, you know, things have been chaos here like they are, are everywhere, um, you know, but, but good chaos. It's been great to be able to, uh, you know, have the support to have practices this fall. I know it's been very challenging for all athletic programs to, to navigate that and get started this, this year. And so um, it's been great to be back with the team again, even with some of the precautions and things that we've we've faced this year and so it's been been great to host practices we were lucky to have some really nice weather here in November and so hope to be having practices out on the water almost to Thanksgiving which will be nice oh wow wow that's that's that yeah, it was 75 here today yeah, that's great. I didn't know it could be that warm in Michigan in November um so it's it's going to help us out you know with our outdoor erg room and rowing outside for the next you know week and a half two weeks <laughs> Sure, sure, and and I guess the big question um, that that a lot of a lot of coaches are uh, are managing, you know, across the, the the landscape right now, but particularly in the college ranks, is you know what precautions are you guys taking right now in prep for the spring, whether there is going to be a competitive season or not? How what what are you how are you how are you as a coach and coaching staff? How are you managing expectations and and and, and what are you what are you what are you telling your athletes? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's been very, it's been challenging because none of our athletes have raced since it's been just over a year now. Last weekend would have been a year for them because mm -hmm. um, we didn't really have any racing uh, before things were, were disbanded this spring. And the Big Ten Conference doesn't have any um, fall sports except for football right now. So we've been trying to, you know, just kind of keep the team focused on the end goal, which is ultimately to have a spring season, um, you know, kind of being grateful for the opportunities that we have to train together and be together. Um, and have that sort of environment and then setting up inner squad racing opportunities and having that sort of environment and practice. So we still have events every Saturday that are kind of like our version of race day, you know, so whether it's having competitions between our pods or between boats or on land or on the water, whatever we're able to do that weekend, trying to find other ways to just have that sort of competitive environment for the team too. Cool. You know, over the last, I guess it's been um, eight, eight months or so we've had, you, you, this will be that thirty third webinar, and um, I want a, how far back to to sort of the the beginning of this can you can you sort of go back and talk us through what you know what that conversation was like with with the group, you know when you were looking at the the the, the spring season for twenty twenty and 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 talking to your athletes um, about about what this year was was going to look like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So certainly, you know, finding out that the, the season was disbanded last spring was, you know, super challenging. Um, you know, I've had hard athlete, hard athlete conversations before. It's by far one of the, the hardest I've ever had was having to tell our seniors, you know, that the season was over. Um, and so we were really lucky that we found out the information right as practice started. 
Um, so we were actually together as a team. So it wasn't like leaked through social media or that sort of situation where we were able to actually grab our seniors and tell them first and then tell the rest of the team. Um, and we were able to have a row as a team, you know, so our seniors had a last row, um, which I know for some programs and some sports wasn't possible, but we were able to give them some of that, that closure, which was really cool. Yeah, I could imagine that would have been quite emotional. It was. How, it was terrible. Was that? <laughs> I was that would have been it was wow. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. But, you know, it was good that we were all together. That is the one thing in retrospect I'm super grateful for. You know, in the moment, it was a really, really hard conversation and a really challenging environment to be in. But in retrospect, I couldn't be more grateful that that's how it how it turned out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's for all of us, you know, whether it's competing at the Olympic Games through to, you know, uh, finishing you know, finishing your athletic career through injury that you never thought you'd end the way that you, that you did. I think the 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 opportunity to have closure um, probably at the time didn't feel like it, but because I guess for all of us we were like, what is actually going on here? But to have that kind of closure would have been um, quite quite. I mean, I haven't heard I really haven't heard too many stories like that because we're all trying to scramble around and figure out okay, what is actually going to happen here. So yeah. have you have you talked to any of those athletes, you know, since they, they, they finished up? Have you been in, in touch with those athletes that that, that was their last row? Yeah. So our seniors, we had seven seniors last year. Um, and so we we were able to host like a virtual team banquet. Um, right. So when we went all virtual, we did have some, you know, team meetings and stuff like that, which we held with them, kind of made sure everybody was supported off to the right place as they left campus here. Um, and, you know, we had some international students who needed support, you know, leaving and and other things that were going on. Um, so we were able to host a, a team banquet virtually and kind of have that sort of celebration and closure of the end of their careers here at Michigan State. Um, so that was really nice to be able to host for them. And because they, they were home, they were able to have their families there as a part of that too. Um, and we also invited people's families to like join on Zoom, you know, if they were, they were separate too. So it made it a very inclusive um, event virtually for them. Um, and so quite a few of them had jobs and things set up um, as they had left campus before things happened. Um, we have one that's doing student teaching this year virtually, um, who we've been in touch with a good bit, just trying to, you know, check in on her and see how she's doing. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been hard, you know, I'm sure for them to kind of, you know, head out on their professional careers that way, but it's been good to be in touch with them. Yeah, I mean, it, it just takes me back now to, to thinking, <clears throat> you know, a little bit more than a year ago before you, before you got the job. Um, if, if you could have, I mean, I think this is for all of us. If someone could have told you then what was about to happen, um, would like, could you, can you think, I mean, I'm trying to think myself, how, how would we prepare ourselves for what we've just, what we've just been through? Do you think there's anything that you would have done differently or, you know, to prepare for this craziness? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not really sure, you know, I think there are definitely moments though prior to everything happening that you just, you don't embrace as much or appreciate as much until later. And so, you know, having the opportunities to race last fall, I think I would have appreciated them a little more in the moment. Um, you know, as a coach, you know, certainly there's moments on on race day, whether it's a real race or scrimmage or whatever, where it's like really stressful and you're just trying to navigate that and you're maybe not embracing as much of the opportunity that it is. So I think I'd be a bit more grateful overall. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm sure from an athletic perspective, I I can think back to you know those those last moments where you just you wish you could slow everything down a little bit is is definitely that that feeling of how do you appreciate it all? And then going back, was there a point where um <clears throat> before you started at Michigan State where you had made a decision you really wanted to become a head coach of a collegiate program? Oh, so I got involved in coaching, not really the normal way. Um, I, I went to graduate school in Boston and um, my plan had been to move to Boston and to find a part-time job to, you know, be able to eat and pay rent while going to school. And um, I struggled to find one and I ran out of money pretty quickly. And I was grateful that uh, one of my college coaches connected me at the head of the Charles with some other coaches in the Boston area and got me my first coaching job. Um, and so I worked for, for several years in the Boston area coaching as many teams that would take me um, just because the schedule worked really well and I loved the sport and um, when I got my first real job um, in the DC area I, I started helping a friend um, he needed assistant coaches for a high school team and I ultimately took over as the head coach for that program um, and so it kind of became like I had two 
full-time jobs, essentially coaching high school rowing and, and my actual real job at a hospital. And so I was lucky to have a supportive partner who was kind of like, okay, you know, I think this is what you're actually passionate about and kind of, you know, gave me the opportunity to really pursue that. Um, so yeah, I think it was, you know, I was taking, I was taking personal days and sick days at my real job to drive the trailer to Stokesbury. And so I think it was like stuff like that, where it really kind of showed that that's what I was more passionate about, that that was the right fit for me. And then in terms of the, the process of saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to throw my eggs in this, this crazy coaching basket, because you mentioned an interesting thing of the normal approach to coaching. And I, I there's very few coaches that one day woke up and said, I want to be a coach one day. How do I do that? It's sort of like you say, I mean, I think many of us had multiple jobs thinking, how am I going to keep doing this? Is it worth it? You know, at what point did you sort of make, how did that, how did that, that tell it, talk us through that sort of those next few steps of, you know, commit fully committing to coaching and then the sort of pursuit of a head coaching job. Yeah, so I mean, I had had a, a good bit of a junior and high school coaching and club, college club coaching experience at that point. And so I was determined to find a full time coaching position. Um, you know, and, and one of the one of the opportunities that presented itself was within college coaching as an assistant coach at Stetson University was my first, um, you know, full time division one coaching job um, and, and had a, a great experience there and really felt that that was the right fit for me. And then it was just, you know, kind of navigating the right fits after that, gaining more experience in areas I didn't have and getting to work for some really great head coaches, too. Yes, yeah, certainly the mentoring piece is, is a big one. And then in terms of um, in terms of the, the dreaded applications, how many how many did you go through where, you know, because because I think we're all we've all been through it. How many of those no's did you just think, you know what? And maybe you didn't have any no's. Maybe Michigan State was your first and only um, real dive into it but not true yeah. <laughs> the, rest of the, 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 the 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 head game that you have to go through of am i going to apply going through the process of applying calling the references you know then at some point you start to believe hey what happens if they call me what happens if i get offered the job can i actually do i want to do this so talk us through that um the highs and lows of that process yeah, you know, and I think at the end of, of every every season I had as an assistant, right, like as positions open up and everything like that, you know, I think it's really kind of navigating if that could be the right fit for you, you know, and I think it's always better to apply and learn more about a program or get to know coaching staffs and head coaches and learn more about opportunities that are out there rather than to not apply. Um, so I applied for a lot of positions and I've had a lot of no's too, which is okay. Um, you know, but it was, it's, it's been, it's been a good experience to help kind of broaden the horizon of, of what's out there and, and, and learn more about it for sure. And then, you know, I, I shared with you before, there was, there was a couple of good questions about how do you know, how do you know when, how do you know when's the right time? How do you know when the right opportunity is the one to actually say, okay, I'm ready because I think that, that, that for so many coaches who want to become head coaches, like I've been offered a head coaching job. I, I don't know if it's ever going to happen again. I'm just going to take the, the sort of first one. So how did you sort of navigate the, the, that thought process of, okay, I've been offered a job and this is the one I, I, I really think I, I, I'm going to take. Yeah. And so I think whether it's a head coach job or an assistant coach job, any job, right? Like when you go on that interview, you know, and I know interviews are so virtual now, but like, you know, it's really kind of like trying to envision yourself there, like getting to know the culture of the staff there, the culture of the athletic department there. Is that the right fit for you? Is it a good fit for you? Um, it's not just taking, you know, the first opportunity that presents itself, like it has to be the right opportunity in order for it to be, you know, the the great long-term fit or, or the next step in your, your career for sure. You know, there's definitely been opportunities that have presented themselves that I've said no to because it wasn't the right fit for one reason or another. Yeah, yeah. You know, my, this is one of my favorite favorite um, <clears throat> discussion topics when it comes to to job interviews. Is what did they not tell you? Um, you know, is is there anything? And, and I'm not. I don't want to single out <laughs> this particular job, but just in your experience, you know, if if you know if you could go back and, and just probe a little bit more, you know, they didn't tell me about how bad the boats were, you know, or they didn't tell me about you know, the traffic on the water, you know, the traffic to and from the boathouse, little things like that. Is there anything there that, that jumps out at you? Because I, I always think that's, that's one question I ask people after they've come from a job interview is 
what did you hear them not talk about? What did they, what did they, what did they not, you know, speak to? And, and and not that that's sinister or mean or they're hiding anything, but just, just, can you speak to that one at all? Yeah. So, you know, I don't think anything was intentionally left out when I interviewed here. Um, I don't believe that at all. But when I did interview here, you know, I, I interviewed with administrators and support staff members and stuff like that. So no one who had really been a part of practices here, you know, so certainly when I started here, the first three weeks, it was just me as we hired assistants and things like that. So there were little surprises, I think, that came along the way with that. Um, not that the administrators here, or the support staff didn't tell me their knowledge of everything. But, you know, there were there were things just kind of poking around where you're like, oh, okay, I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, and you just you got to deal with it as it comes, um, for sure. Let's let's talk a little bit more about that that support from the athletic department because I think that's that's such a critical critical role. How is that how is that unfolded in terms of how has the athletic department sort of presented you um, enough space to be able to do what you wanted to do, but also provided you sort of a bit of a roadmap for for how you you, you navigate that, particularly those first few months. I can imagine it's just overwhelming all the things you have to to either make decisions about or figure out how to prioritize, but how is that support from the athletic department in, in terms of you know, the balance between giving you enough space to figure it out yourself, but also not to leave you out hanging to, to make decisions without all the information you need? Yeah, so I've been lucky to have two really great sport administrators here. The first one I had, um, did a great job of, of doing as much as he could to support me during that transition. His background was in coaching. Uh, he was a, a soccer coach um, before becoming an administrator. And um, I think that really helped having someone help me navigate the process who had been a coach before, even if it wasn't for rowing. Um, so there were a lot of things that he already knew about when I got here. And so when it was just me for those three weeks, you know, we've, I probably met with him daily and he, you know, helped with, with other things that were going on or took, just took the initiative to do something that I may have needed, you know, knowing it was just me for those first few weeks. Um, and I have a great sport administrator now uh, who's been here at Michigan State for a long time and worked with several other programs here. Um, and so that's been a, a good fit as well, um, just having someone who's really knowledgeable about the university. So like, I didn't know how to send mail last week, which seems so silly at this point. But in my slight defense, the mailroom was closed for six months, um, you know, but like the, the person who you can call like with a silly question like that, where you're like, well, how do I do this? Um, you know, like just kind of helping you navigate some of those things at the university that you may not know too. So whether that is like your direct administrator or someone else, it's always good to have like that person who's been somewhere for a while who can help point you in the right direction for some of those little things that you may not know on the ground at a place. Yeah, yeah, no, that 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 that's that's really helpful because I think I think that's always the the question, you know, going into a new role of who do you who do you who who can you lean on to ask the what may seem like a stupid question, but but you really need to have like an answer, like how do I send this thing in the mail? <laughs> yeah, um, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've used a inner campus mail for the first time uh, just <laughs> recently. <laughs> What about um, in terms of mentors, in terms of people that you've sort of um, been able to reach out to to get, you know, an extra set of eyes or you know, a, 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 you know, a, a really objective set of ears to to hear out, you know, challenges. Who have you who have you been able to to lean on in that respect? Yeah, so I've been very lucky in you know my coaching career to this point to have some really phenomenal coworkers and uh, head coaches that I've worked for. Um, the head coach I worked for prior to this position, Dan Garbett at Old Dominion University, has been a phenomenal resource. Um, at, at one point working here, I probably called him every day. Um, just being like, now what? Um, and so he's always a good sounding board for me for for whatever the next chaotic thing is. Um, and there's others that I have as well, just from different areas of of life so far that are they're just great people to to go to for advice and feedback. And um, you know, certainly in challenging situations, it's never bad to have you know an extra set of thoughts or ears or eyes on whatever it is that you're doing you know some of the budgetary stuff that we've done this year our uh, boatman here costas has been great just kind of looking over some of the planning we're doing and the work that we're doing we're looking at budgetary items from the year before where we can make adjustments for this coming year and still you know run the program um it's been really good to have people who can look over those things and you can trust while doing it too you've always um you've always struck me as someone that's that's been very um <clears throat> committed to your own learning um and and never never afraid to sort of ask ask a question just because you're really curious and and i and i'd love to to for you to just to speak a little bit about your experience with the with with your own education and just 
the decisions you've made along the way to sort of advance yourself because you know there's there, there's there's a there's a large vocal group that says you can't you can't learn how to coach in a classroom and and I'm yeah I'd be one of the first to agree with that but tell us just a little bit about you know the decisions you've made along the way to advance yourself you know through your studies and and just just genuine desire to be a better coach oh yeah absolutely and that's one of the things that drew me to the program at Drexel for sure is you know if, if you have a better foundation in you know coaching and and that area um you know kind of helps you to to adapt and move forward and um you know as the pandemic started i must have gotten uh, you know 18 zoom invites a week you know just to different professional learning stuff and at one point i was on so many i was like okay i need to scale it back a little bit uh, because i think i just threw myself into that not having practice to go to you know just like trying to learn from other people and i think you know, coaching is something you can always continue to learn within. You can always become a better coach, just like you could become a better at anything, right? Like, and we expect our, our athletes to be coached and to be coachable. And I think you should have the same expectations for yourself as a coach, you know, being willing to put in the work and development to be a better coach for your team too, you know, to communicate with athletes better or to learn a different technique. And there's so many phenomenal coaches that are out there that are great to, to learn from too. Yeah, it, it's it's such an interesting one because there are, a, 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 I won't say a lot of coaches, but there is a mindset out there of coaches where you stick with what works. And and I think obviously there's, there is there is that approach, but there's also the, the, the counter to that of um, <clears throat> I can always do it a little bit better, whether it's more efficiently um, or connect with other people. If you, um, if, if you had, you know, if, if learning's at the, maybe at the top of your list or in the top couple, what would you say the, the, the top tips you'd give to a new head coach if you were, if you were talking to yourself a year ago, what would you, what would you, what would the advice be? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I think with that, right. And we kind of hit her on it already a little bit is like, don't be afraid to ask for help, right? Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with trying to, to, to navigate being a first time head coach and making decisions independently, but don't be afraid to ask for help or ask what someone's experience was doing the same thing. You know, like, um, I think that was something that, that there were a lot of coaches here within the athletic department, um, who had been here for a long time. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, well, like there's uh, the football coach has, has been here less than me now, but uh, initially, you know, I was the coach had been here the, the least. And so there were some people who'd been the head coach here for 20 years, um, you know, so like our men's tennis coach has been here for a really long time. And so he was really great to just kind of learn from, from that experience that he had had here. And so I think always, you know, being willing to, you know, reach out to others, I think is super important. Like you're not alone in being a first time head coach. Everybody's been there at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's doing the outreach. It's, it's asking the questions and it's, it's that open, I, I definitely hear you that open-minded approach to, you know, listening to, to what others, others think. And I think that's, again, that's not necessarily um, uh, the, 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 the approach that everybody has. Um, and, and I think that's such a, that's such a cool aspect to what you bring to the table um, in terms of um, in terms of just balancing coaching with, with quote unquote real life, how do you manage that that balance? Knowing that um, coaching is, you know, it's just endless. There's there's no end to all the things that we could all be doing. How do you how do you manage the 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 the, light, the real life side of, of of all that comes to being being a head coach? Yeah, uh, you know, certainly like most people, I do that better some days than others. Um, but I'm I, I am really grateful to have a very supportive partner and to have three really wonderful and adaptable little girls um, who who do understand that I, I am a coach and and sometimes my job has crazy hours or responsibilities or things like that. Um, and so I think one of the biggest things that's been good for me is you know when I am with them and I am focusing time on, on my children or on my family is trying to shut off other areas, right? Like it's super easy to just like be on your phone all the time. And like my email follows me and like the Apple watch, it'll still buzz. And it's like, no, like you have to take your watch off. Like you have to put your phone on silent. And even if that is like telling other people in your life or on your staff, like, Hey, I'm going to be doing this. I'm not going to be available. You know, like it, having boundaries, I think helps a lot. Boundaries. Let's go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the recruiting piece is endless, right? Contact with our alumni. You know, you can always be doing more. And in that in that vein, how do you um like how do you manage that? Is it is it really? I mean, obviously, it depends on the time of the year. It depends on the urgency of, of what's going on. But but in terms of that um that that management of that is that is that something that you've just figured out along the way that that's that's your style or have you sort of picked from others to to see how they do it how how have you how how has your style of of balancing everything um evolved over the over the years oh that's a good question um you know i think having been a student for a long time and been a student athlete myself like you just like you you start those habits very very early and so I feel like they've just continued to carry over and adapt um now that we do a lot more virtual recruiting I've definitely had to set myself like times where I'm not available um but yeah I think it's it's you just gotta know what you can handle and manage and then also give yourselves breaks when you need it you know like there are definitely times where you got to step away from the zoom um <laughs> and uh step away from the screens and stuff like that um yeah it's taken probably a long time to get there definitely the first several weeks i worked here i probably worked you know 10 hour days seven days a week for the first six weeks i worked here um pretty easily um but you know finding finding balance when you can have it at those points of the year is really important you know like there's definitely like spring travel right like when you're racing and stuff like that you know there's weekends back to back where you have a lot more going on but then it's like okay then take your break in the summer when you have it to to do some of those other things and spend time with family and stuff you know just trying to find balance in the the times of year you, that you can have it yeah yeah and there's definitely the ebb and flow on the time of the year I, I i was just having this conversation with someone the other day it just feels like the ramp up to thanksgiving like right now it always just seems like it's mayhem and you just like Give me the turkey. I just want to sit in front of the TV, watch some football, and eat way too much food. But it's it's two weeks away, you know. Yeah, so. we're there soon, soon, <laughs> soon. Costco's already selling pie if you want it. Um, <laughs> they sell this like um, apple pie that's like the size of a pizza. Um, <laughs> not that we have it or anything, but it's it's quite good. Very cool. Hey. Um, just to, to dive in, you know, I, 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 I'd love just to, to, to take a sneak peek into your reflections on preparing for the interview, because I think um, the, the, the ultimate question that I think we all come back to is, why do you want the job? And, you know, in a job interview, you can be asked that question in so many different ways. And, and I'm just curious, you know, going back, you know, why, why did you think that becoming a head coach was was something that you you felt like was the the next logical step yeah yeah so i was really lucky um to to work for for several head coaches who gave me the opportunity to really try everything or to be willing when i asked to try something you know so like if i didn't have experience with doing care logs or compliance work like asking for that opportunity or changing responsibilities to have the chance to do it and they were, they were willing to be mentors in that way which has been phenomenal um, you know, and I feel like I had kind of gotten to that point where it was like I had experience in recruiting, I had experience in team travel and team training and in compliance stuff and in uh, alumni stuff. And I had kind of gotten the opportunity to try all different things. Um, and so I think I was ready just to kind of take that next step. Um, and I think it was really finding the the right fit to to do that with, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great, I mean, it's a great, great answer. And I think that's that is always the most difficult piece of, you know, looking at the motivation as to why. And then once you get in the job of looking around going, okay, what, what can I do? What can others do? And what do I have to do? And so I'm, I'm curious, just going into that one, what's, is there one thing that, you know, you have to do and you wish someone else would do, but you have to do it anyway? Ooh. You know, the one thing that I try to avoid doing, maybe that's the answer, is um, food planning for team trips. There's nothing I hate more than <laughs> planning food for a team trip. I would rather insert care logs for 90 people every day. I would rather, you know, be responsible for calling an airline and really arranging that and changing names on every flight than I would for food. I don't know what it is. It's just like one of those things that it's just very stressful for me. I don't care for that one. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Well, yeah. 
the, the, I guess the good thing about that is there's others around that can can very easily fill that task. I know for me, the budgeting piece, it just it just my brain bleeds because I'm like, how do I know how many people and how far and you know all of those those little details? How are you managing the budgeting yeah. piece? Yeah, so I guess that's one that's changed for me since the pandemic started. Is the budgeting one is is certainly far 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 more stressful. And event, uh, you know, initially everything was like the opposite way of like, okay, you have to cut X percent or, you know, you can only spend this on your team travel or whatever. And then we really shifted to the opposite of what is a necessary expense. And so it was really stressful for me trying to plan like cuts of, you know, 10% or 15% or 20% or whatever it was. Um, but then looking at it the other way of like, what is a necessity? Like, what do we need in order to function? And when you look at it that way, th that made it far less stressful, you know, like, okay, we need gas for the coaching launches, you know, we need uniforms, we need X, like that made it a lot more manageable for me was to look at it the opposite way. Yeah. I, I love that because I think what, what it, what it does for you is you realize how, I don't want to say how few things you actually need, but you really, you sort of strip it, strip it back and go, okay, what, 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 what is fundamental to making this thing work? And then, then building back, um, how, how that, that will, that will be a very interesting one. I think for, for all athletic departments and almost all sporting organizations, as we get back to it is, you know, what, what will you, you know, potentially not do moving forward because you've figured out you can, you can do it, um, without. And so from a, from a, you know, from a technology standpoint and communicating, you know, whether it's with recruits, whether it's with the, the current group, even alums, how have you guys um, evolved in that space over the pandemic? Just just with just the general, you know, what would have been face to face events? How have you how have you been able to supplement and adapt using, you know, Zoom and other online um, technologies to communicate and connect? Yeah, well, I was joking before this started to Cam that I was on a Big Ten head coaches call where we were talking about hosting a Zoom Coxons meeting for the Big Ten championship, you know, which, like I said, uh, you said to you earlier, if you had asked me that a year ago, I would have been like, just cancel the meeting. Why would we have it on Zoom? Whereas now today I was like, oh, yeah, that's a phenomenal idea. Like, when can we plan it for that it would work for people to do? Um yeah, like I've ne I had never planned a Zoom meeting before. I actually sat in on a Zoom webinar in like April because I couldn't really figure out all the logistics of it, you know, so learning how to do it and adapting. I didn't realize how many like games and things you can play and do as a team, like via Zoom and virtually. Uh, the team has introduced me to so many things. Um, you know, you can play trivia, you can watch movies, you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, to socialize on the platform, um, which has been quite cool. Um, we've been able to invite, you know, prospective students to engage with the team in those ways too, which are just ideas I had never had before. Um, and I've been recruiting for a while now. And just the idea of, of how hosting those sorts of things had never been on my radar before. How about um, innovations just in terms of, or, or, or anything uh, novel that you've done in just in terms of engaging and keeping athletes motivated? I know that athlete motivation right now is, is 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 really going to be challenged as we go into into the winter um you know what have you what have you found that's worked or what have you heard that that others are doing that that really has been um whether it's a super secret um or or, or just something that, that that really really works to to keep athletes engaged and motivated yeah, so I think as, you know, coaches, you can find little things to do, you know, we had social hours and things like that, um, where, where we were able to engage with the team, which was nice. Um, we had done some, you know, just kind of athlete development stuff. Um, so uh, we had done like the athlete tough program that Bo Hansen um, had put together. We did that this summer with the team. That was really great. I, I do recommend that. Um, one of the things we've talked about doing this winter is kind of more athlete led things, you know, like having someone teach something they're passionate about or pick a book for us to read or, you know, finding ways to engage them. Last year when we were on spring break, each class got to pick an activity for each evening. Um, and they just picked phenomenally fun things that helped engage themselves and their teammates. And so trying to find those opportunities for them to have that sort of interaction with each other. Yeah, I, I I know another that there's 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 a bunch of good ones there. One one that the um that the Australian um, gymnastics uh, high performance team was using was cooking classes, um and Ooh. doing a cooking cooking competition to uh, have family join the Zoom call and 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 they'd have to do a vote of who who had cooked the best meal. I I still quite can't 
figure out if you can't try everyone else's food how, how do you know how yeah anyone else's food but but um but definitely um definitely uh, novel ways of, of bringing people together has 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 definitely been um one of the the aspects of this um that that that, that you know never ceases to amaze me but um in terms of in terms of the mental health conversation and 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 again the support of the university and the athletic department anything in particular that you guys are doing um you know taking it sort of that next step of not just motivation and engagement but knowing that mental health is you know it's it it has if 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 not coming into the pandemic was was a top priority of programs is probably even more so um at the top of everyone's list so what are you guys doing in that respect just keeping an eye on people particularly with isolate isolated are those that are isolated yeah so we're, we're lucky to have a great group of athletic trainers and so when we all uh, separated this spring um our trainers did a really good job of keeping tabs on the team they knew where people were going they checked in with them even if it was just like a quick text or a call um, the Big Ten Conference has sponsored the Calm app, so that's accessible for all of our student athletes and staff, which is nice. Um, and then on campus here, we have a great um, uh, support service program called CAPS, so they can sign up for um, appointments through that. They can connect with our trainer to get set up with appointments, so we have sports psych services and counseling services and stuff like that, um, both within the athletic department or on campus. Um, so there's just lots of great resources for them. Um, sometimes it is kind of that coaxing into, Hey, these, remember these things are available. Um, but you know, eventually they, they, they do test them out and it's always like, you can try, you can go to an appointment with a counselor and decide not to go again. Like you could decide it's not the right fit, but give it a chance and see if it's something that can help support you, you know, during this too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can't, <clears throat> it almost feels like right now there's, there's, there's not, again, not enough that we can do for, for athletes. Um, how about how about just in terms of um, the coaching staff across all 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 you know the 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 Michigan State Athletic Department? How are you guys sort of working together? Um, you know, in, whether it's professional development, whether it's you know just keeping an eye out for each other. How are you guys sort of supporting each other through the highs and lows of this thing? Yeah, so when, um, you know, the the spring happened, I mean, maybe it was starting in April, one of the head coaches here started organizing like weekly happy hours, right? Like just to have that sort of, you know, spot to commiserate or socialize or whatever you kind of like really needed in that moment or week. Um, you know, we've had a lot more head coaches meetings, um, kind of in a positive way, I think, you know, we, we had them maybe once a month before, um, whereas now we have them like weekly or every other week, kind of depending on what's going on. And so I think there's a lot more attention and support out there for us, um, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, in terms of your own professional development, I think I think many of us were in, in that same spot at the beginning of the pandemic of sort of overloading and just you know clicking and and re responding to any kind of request. How how has that sort of shifted for you now? How are you how are you sort of keeping a, a balance between your professional development and and keeping tabs on what's out there and what's happening? Yeah, so I think it's something I've always really prioritized, um, and so I think. You know, when I do get invitations to whether it's the the webinars for here or I'm part of We Coach, which is a phenomenal uh, women's coaches organization, um, and some other some other professional development organizations too, or CRCA will have some that go out. Um, you know, it's kind of just planning your month, right? Like kind of picking and choosing and prioritizing things. And oftentimes things are recorded as well. So you can look at them at your leisure later. Um, so that's something I always really enjoy too, is that sometimes when I get an invitation, I might write back to someone and be like, hey, I won't be able to attend, but if it's recorded, please do send me the link as it's something I'd love to, you know, check out later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it definitely, um, <clears throat> there's, there's still an overload, but but definitely I think for many, we're, we're still getting, you know, uh, a, a lot of requests but but yeah finding that finding that time to to when to when to absorb it and when to step back it was an interesting question a buddy of mine for, who's, who's actually involved with irish rugby asked the question of um <clears throat> what have we learned through the pandemic and i'm curious your answer to that question because i think when 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 the question first came up it was sort of july and it was still still too there was still too much going on to really make sense of it all and a bunch of people said it's too soon to ask that question so um, that could be an easy out for you on this one but um you know what what is is there anything in particular that you would take as a sort of learning during this this period um of in the pandemic as it relates to coaching and and just sport in general 
it is a very challenging question <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, something I've learned from it, you know, like I said earlier, just being, you know, more grateful for things, um, you know, really appreciating opportunities that you have. Um, I think it's definitely changed that perspective for me. Um, you know, and I think also, you know, it's, it's kind of silly to say, but prioritizing your health as a coach too. I've been on a team trip before where I've been very sick and probably shouldn't have gone on the trip before. Right. And it's kind of like slowing down and like really prioritizing being healthy yourself and letting your team be healthy, letting your staff be healthy, being understanding if someone is ill and can't attend something. Um, you know, it's always, you know, one of those moments where you have kind of like, where you're like, oh, you know, like I could just go, like, I'll be fine. And it's like, well, no, like maybe we should, we should have slowed down a little bit to, to start, you know? So I guess it just kind of puts all that into perspective too. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've heard, I've heard it, it's run that it's run the gamut from people saying, um, you know, sports really not that important. Um, and, and that there are other things, you know, while there's health and participation and physical activity, you know, how, how important is sport all the way through to, you know, I think many of us believe that it, that this is really a very unique opportunity. We have to do a bit of a reset and, and rethink particularly youth sport and, and how to balance the, the sort of the obsession of, you know, sp sports specialization, which I know some of your academic colleagues up there at Michigan State are, you know, Andy Drisker and Dan Gould and, and others um, are, are very big proponents of, of, of really thinking about how do we how do we think about multi-sport um, development of, 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 of our younger younger athletes? But 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 certainly the the lessons of the pandemic are, are you know are continuing to continuing to grow and 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 that's hopefully one of the things that we're capturing here with these webinars over the last you know sort of eight or nine months to be able to. To, to, to step back and go, okay, what, what actually is going on for all of us? So, um, Kim, I'm going to open it up. If anyone has any questions, um, you know, feel free to either unmute or, or, or throw them in the, into the chat. Cause, cause I think you've shared, um, so many, so many really cool, um, insights into your own, um, into your own journey here, but also, um, you know, just, just, just what, what we're all dealing with. So, um, so yeah, if anyone has questions, um, go, go ahead. I've, I've got a couple more, um, just in terms of, um, sort of next steps, knowing that, um, where we, where we started off in our call, um, you know, in terms of the spring and preparations and, 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 and just those discussions, what are you guys, have you got a sort of backup plan for what, what if there is another, you know, sort of no season, how, how are you guys preparing for that? Yeah, so I mean, we we've, we've kind of gone through some some different renditions of what a spring season would look like. You know, whether or not we can only compete within our conference or within a specific region. And so I'd say we have some contingency plans in that regard, um, but still pushing ahead. Uh, you know, as 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 for spring racing. You know, so um, I think that's definitely what we've looked at. But kind of knowing that what that'll be in the end is is really up in the air. Um, you know, just kind of as things develop moving towards towards March. Yeah. yeah. And so like we typically go on training trips and stuff like that. And so we've minimized that sort of team travel and tried to make things more regionally based, easier to access, a little less wear and tear on everybody for sure. Yep. Yep. Cool. Cool. Um, question here from one of our um, our master's students. Um, what do you what did you find to be one of the most useful things out of your uh, the, the 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 degree that you did at Drexel? Ooh, I I really enjoyed some of the. Um some of like the coaching theory courses where you got to interact with other coaches who were of different sports, um, just kind of gaining perspective on that, I thought was really cool. Um, and I think it really sets up for, especially a large program where, where like ours, where we have athletes who join from a different sporting background. Often we have a lot of novice athletes who come in with just different sporting experience. Um, so I think that was something that kind of, you know, just broadened that for me. Um, I think it also just kind of helped my coaching experience um, just kind of broaden it a little bit more so like as each adventure develops every day uh you know every 90 minutes is a new new adventure in the COVID pandemic um you know I think it's helped set up some of those things some of the collaboration pieces um that the the program required I think was also really helpful as well um and I know there were parts about like staff management um there was also the part where you had to kind of like make your portfolio which I altered and, and made a version of for when I applied to this position um so that was actually really helpful kind of having that experience of how to develop your coaching portfolio having those things already set up looking at the position you were applying for and how to adapt it and use it effectively 
um, was was something that I think really helped a lot in acquiring this position. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you know, so often coaches laugh at, hey, hey, have you written down your coaching philosophy? Um, and 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 that you know, I think you're 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 a great example of that, Kim, in terms of you know, really really taking the time to think about what it is that you want to do and how, how you're able to articulate that at the beginning of the program, but how that evolved. It's not, it's not a static thing that you just write it down, you know, at the beginning of your coaching career. It, it's one of those things that continues to evolve. And, 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 you know, the research supports exactly what you just said, that coach learning doesn't happen from, you know, a sage on a stage or some, you know, Belichick Jackson, you know, wooden type, you know, legend that, and, and we all, we all love their work, you know, and it's, it's fascinating to hear what they've all done, but how you can sort of look over the fence and say, oh, what does a rugby coach do? Or what does the swimming coach do? Um, you know, some of, some of, some of the most um, fascinating conversations I've, I've had recently are with, with sailing coaches and kayak canoe coaches. And they look at us and go, you rowing people go backwards. What is wrong with you? You know, uh, and and you know the sailing people go wind. We love wind, and obviously we hate it. But but just to be able to look over the fence and say, ah, oh, uh, how do you guys deal with coaching? These are all most of what we talk about are coaching issues. And I think if if we all look at our coaching philosophy, whether it's pages and pages of work or you know one paragraph, there's nothing about the X's and O's. It's not I want to learn how to rig a sailing boat or I want to figure out you know. Uh, you know, a, a better race strategy. It's, you know, it's so much about how do you get the most out of your athletes? Um, often, how do I find better athletes? But how do I get the most out of those athletes that I eventually find? So Brandon, great question. Um, and Kim might be uh, stealing that answer for uh, our testimonials moving forward. So um, I am very respectful of everybody's time. And I know that we live in this world of back to back to back to back to back Zoom meetings. So are there, if there aren't any other questions, I've got one last one for you. And that is, um, what is on your book stand right now? What are you reading? What, uh, what, what's, the, what's the book of choice that you either are reading or want to read or have just read? <laughs> I am reading trying to think what I what I what I've recently read or what's on the 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 nightstand here um I guess I have a couple of things um so I've I've been uh lucky to to be a part of our uh DEI group uh at through the CRCA and through through Michigan State um and so the they have a great reading list um within that and so um one of the books White Fragility is one of the books that I have on my my nightstand um I also just recently purchased a a cookbook of Indian cooking recipes um because I really like Indian food and so that's going to be one of the items that I I really try to pursue here in December when I can't be at practice um I'm trying to think what else um i have i i did um i am doing the uh, level three course and i'm a little behind in a few of the readings and assignments there so i have a few of those on my my task list as well so i would say those are <laughs> those are probably the three that i have right now um is through the book club through uh cooking and then through um the level three course through us rowan too awesome awesome well very good Paul has a good one here. What are some of the major differences in being a head coach versus an assistant? And as a head coach, have you ever had doubts or questioned yourself about becoming a head coach? Great questions, Paul. Love it. Um, one of the major differences in being a head coach versus an assistant coach, um, probably in those moments that are chaotic or not going well, when you look around and you realize that you are who is in charge and responsible for this fully, there is no one else to blame. Um, where it's like, okay, I need to like own this, um, situation, <laughs> uh, not necessarily even a bad situation. Right. Like, but you know, just, I think knowing that you're the person who's responsible for that and that's kind of the role you've stepped into, you know, so regardless of what an assistant coach or athlete is doing that you're responsible for that. And, you know, I think you have to take ownership and accountability for it. Um, and, and know that's something you've bought into is taking on that sort of role um, where you're responsible for, for more than just yourself. Um, you know, personally and professionally, I feel like between both every day, I feel like I'm responsible for about a hundred people between the team and then my, my family um, and then my staff, of course, too. And so I think it's just kind of taking the ownership and care for those hundred people, right? Like if that's not something you're bought into, I wouldn't advise being a head coach. Um, 
So I think that's probably one of them. Um, and have you ever had doubts or questioned yourself about being a head coach? I think all the time, right? Like, you know, I think there's there's always those moments. Um, but I think it's, you know, really standing by the decisions that you're making. And if you're making a decision for the benefit of everyone, you're really looking at your group of athletes and you're trying to do the best that you can for them. Um, I think that really answers the doubt or question that you have, right? Like if you can make a decision and know that you're doing it in the best interest of everyone um, and that you're trying to support whatever it is they need, um, because um, ultimately your athletes very likely are going to become other things, um, you know, like our athletes here, you know, maybe some pursue something like the national team or the U23 team or something like that, but ultimately they're going to become other things. And if you're setting them up for success in those areas, um, I think that's really important too. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, the questions. Very good. Paul, love that uh, answer. Thank you, Kim. Dustin says, did you have to work around, um, poor team culture and if not how did you put um your own touch on the program to make it yours yeah so um you know i don't know necessarily that it was poor team culture just a different one um you know that that i stepped into here um and i think it was being kind of really upfront with the team about like what my goals were uh for the program i think it was understanding the culture they had when i arrived here and trying to instill upon them you know what some of my priorities were and, and how that could benefit them as well. Um, you know, so team culture was something that we had talked a lot about when I first started here. And it wasn't, I don't think that they had necessarily a poor team culture. They just had one that was a little more segmented, right? Like the novices all work together and the varsity eights all work together and the fours work together. And so they were just like a little bit separated. Um, and we spent a lot of time last fall, you know, being more in a full team environment, everybody doing the same work on the water or lining up all the boats side by side or really mixing up lineups. Um, you know, having people sit in boats before with teammates they had never sat with before. Um, and so I think it was really just kind of explaining to them, you know, embracing being a large team and having that sort of culture and priority was important. And I think it was something they embraced because we tried to explain it to them, you know, so rather than just making sweeping changes without really explaining to the group why, um, I think was helpful for them. And I think it's a, it's, 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 it's a great response to a really, really important question of how do you make it your own? Because what, what it sounds like to me, Kim, is, is, is that you've really taken the time to understand, you know, who, who is in the group and even from year to year, that's going to be different. So did you, did you feel that the, the, the lead, the, the student athlete leadership was sort of intact when you, when you, when you got, got into the role or was that something you sort of had to unravel and, and, and put together in your own way as, as you figured out who you were dealing with um, within the program? Yeah, I don't know that they necessarily had, I mean, they had some people on the team who were, were leaders, but I don't know that it was um, really set up in a structured like way, if that makes sense, um, yeah. which this year we've kind of tried to move a little bit more towards that, but also trying to find a way to represent the greater group. So we have our, we call it our team leadership council, where there's two representatives from each class year. Um, so like we have two senior representatives, two junior, two sophomore, and then at the end of this fall, we'll actually pick two freshmen, but in the freshman group, we'll have one that's a novice and we'll have one that's a, a recruited freshman who trains with the varsity group. And so having representation across the board, um, having the team have a say in who some of their team leaders are, they get to pick one of the representatives from uh, their class year and then the other class years get to pick the other the second representative from their class mm -hmm. so like the seniors picked one and then the juniors sophomores and freshmen pick the other senior you know so kind of just trying to find other ways to make it a more inclusive group um i think was was helpful very good very good awesome all right absolutely dustin it was a fantastic answer and um awesome awesome discussion kim so um at this point, I'm just going to say thank you so much. This has been been wonderful and always great to connect. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll keep in touch and uh, and we'll we'll reconnect some point in the new year. All right. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.